When you work with the Unity game engine, one of the most fundamental concepts you'll have to wrap your head around is the game object. Everything is based around them, from your on-screen characters to the sound effects, the UI and even the execution of your c -sharp scripts. Basically, a game object is an empty container that is filled with components to gradually compose a more complex behavior. Some of those components are for rendering, others are for physics collisions and gravity computation, others for emitting sounds, and of course you'll also usually want to drag and slap your own scripts on your game objects to actually play your logic in the game. So, game objects are essential. Okay, but how exactly do you create them? How do you spawn game objects in your Unity scenes, be it in edit mode or at runtime? Today, we're gonna look at instantiating game objects into Unity with four levels of difficulty. You ready? Let's go then! Level 1. Placing objects in edit mode. The first time you jump into the Unity editor, you might be a bit lost in all the UI and the panels and the assets visualizers and the scene preview. But after watching a few YouTube tutorials and retaking the same steps over and over again, you'll probably start to know your way around the software. And chances are that pretty soon you'll begin to populate your 3D scene with all kinds of objects. Cubes, spheres, characters from the asset store, your own 3D models, and so on. The process to add a new game object in your scene is amazingly simple. If you want to create an empty anchor with no predefined components attached to it, or if you want to add very basic shapes, like cubes and spheres for example, you can just go to the game object menu and take your pick. By the way, those built-in basic meshes are called primitives, and even if they probably won't be enough if you plan on making your own AAA game, they're usually a great starting point while the artists on your team are preparing the real assets. If you want to instantiate one of your own project assets in the scene, then just drag it from your project folder into either the scene view or the hierarchy. Using both those techniques, you'll have a new object in your scene that you can select in your hierarchy and that has a position, a rotation and a scale. Those are stored together as a Unity transform. From there, you can add lots of components to boost your game objects and give them more advanced behaviors. Level 2. Creating primitive shapes at runtime. Now, dragging stuff in your scene in edit mode is nice, but what if you want to spawn game objects at runtime? For example, what if you want to use procedural generation to get an infinite level for a runner game? In that case, you obviously can't prepare your game objects beforehand. Instead, you'll want to use a script to create your game objects at runtime. If you're still at the prototyping phase and you're fine using primitives, then Unity actually makes it quite simple to create a new game object. All you have to do is create a new c -sharp script and import the Unity engine package. Then have a new class and somewhere call some code that uses the gameObject.createPrimitive function. You'll find all the primitive types you see in the editor ready to be used, and you'll also be able to easily access the transform of the newly created object to set its position, rotation or scale. Automating game objects instantiation is a really important skill for any Unity dev. But what if you're past the point where you're using primitives? What if you want to copy back more complex game objects in your scene, with all the nice components you added earlier? In that case, you'll want to rely on prefabricated objects, or prefabs. Level 3. Instantiating a prefab from a viable. Unity prefabs are the key to creating reusable assets. They allow you to store a game object in your project with all its current configuration, components and even hierarchy of child game objects, so that this little piece of your scene is safely saved from one session to another 
and can be re-imported elsewhere in your game, either in edit mode or at runtime. In edit mode, it's just like before, you just have to drag the prefab from your project folder and you'll get a brand new copy of your game object. Via script, however, it requires an additional step compared to spawning primitives. Since your prefabs are not Unity built-ins, the engine can't just give you a direct reference to them by itself. Rather, it's up to you to get, in your c -sharp script, a link to the prefab that you want to instantiate. A very common way to do that is by simply declaring a game object viable in your script, either as a public viable or a private serialized viable, so that it shows in the inspector. And then you just have to drag your prefab into the newly created slot that appears in your script associated component. Finally, inside the script, you can use Unity's gameObject.instantiate method and use this reference to create a new copy of your prefab inside the scene at runtime. Just like before, you'll also have access to the position, rotation, and scale. However, this quick reference technique doesn't work all the time. What if the prefab to instantiate was created dynamically in a prior step? Or what if it depends on the context and that the reference can only be computed when the script is executed? For example, let's say you're generating a dungeon map and you have dozens of wall variations so that the player doesn't see too much repetition. You will most likely won't want to store all these prefabs inside your script. That would take a lot of space and it would make it really hard to read. Here, a better idea is to load the data directly from your project assets at runtime. Level 4. Loading up a prefab from your project assets. To be honest, Unity's memory management and asset serialization process is pretty complex, so there are lots of intricate details that you'll have to get into if you really want your game to be optimized and fully cross-platform compatible. But for prototypes or small-scale projects, a proven technique is to rely on the resources folder and the resources.load method. The resources folder is a special folder that you can create in your project. Be careful it is not created by default and that will be recognized by the Unity engine as the place where you put addressable and dynamically loadable assets. Everything that is put in this folder will be copied into the builds of your game, which means that those things will still be loadable at runtime in the build version of your game. Remember though that you should try and not overload this folder with assets that do not require the setup because it could make really bloated builds. But anyway, if you have some prefabs that you want to load dynamically at runtime, then simply put them into the resources folder or any subfolder for that matter, it will work no matter how deep the level. And from that point on, you'll be able to access the assets in your C-sharp script with resources.load. Don't forget to specify the type of asset that you expect so that the compiler can safely retrieve it. In the case of prefabs, you want to make a game object viable. And at that point, you're all set to populate your scenes with all kinds of neatly prepared prefabs. Bonus, taking advantage of the overrides. Just before we end this video, I want to point out that in c -sharp, just like in many other programming languages, you have this really neat feature of functions overrides to let you call the same function in multiple ways. The idea is that you define several prototypes for the same method, and so depending on the parameters that you pass in, the engine will automatically look up the list of possibilities and use the matching logic. Now, why am I talking about this? Well, because in Unity, the gameobjects.instantiate method actually has several prototypes, and in particular, it has one override to directly set the position and the rotation of your object. Sweet, right? We don't actually need those extra lines anymore. We can just put everything in the instantiate call. And that's all for me for now. I really hope you enjoyed this video. Please feel free to tell me if it's been helpful in the comments. And of course, if you want to see more of this content, you can support my work by liking and sharing the video and by subscribing to the channel. 
Oh, and if you want to discover more of my videos, be sure to check out those two that I made recently. As always, thanks a lot for watching, and see you soon for more videos on coding and games.